Welcome to Cannabis Investing Newsletter. I'm D.H. Taylor. Today, I want to look at a company called Schwaz. They're out of Colorado. You may have heard of them. They used to be Medicine Man Technologies. Changed their name, and they're moving forward. They just recently closed a deal uh, growing their footprint considerably. They now have about 17 different dispensaries and are somewhat the premier company in Colorado. They're also what I would consider a very hidden gem. I want to show you a couple things. First, we've gotten some guidance for them. They've revised their own guidance upwards after Q1. Number two, they've also given us pro forma looking backwards as to what they, their revenues could have been had they closed their most recent deal more quickly. So you're looking at a company that I believe is considerably undervalued, and yet they are still pushing uh, EBITDA and net profitability real close. I believe this year they close the deal, they become net profitability. Doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to see that net profitability trickle through. They may very well take their profits and build that footprint even further. Given that, there's something about this company that I love very much. These guys are probably going to make it in my top picks real fast. Let's take a look at some numbers. Some essentials. As I mentioned, they're a Colorado-based company. One of the things you need to understand about Colorado is simply this. When they first put together the laws, they wanted to make sure that they were these laws were bulletproof, that uh, voters could sit there and say, yeah, you know what, I don't have a problem voting for this. And so they made it so highly restrictive that there was no question that uh, people from out of the state are going to come in and buy kilos and ship it off to New York and places like that. One of the restrictions is that Colorado companies are only allowed to operate inside Colorado companies. They can't expand into new states. Well, a lot of these uh, new states are don't have as serious at, or restrictive of laws. So I look at this in kind of two ways. Number one, it is very restrictive, and that could be a, a an asset. Number two, more than likely, the, the laws will probably change at some point. But I just did a, a, an analysis on a company called Gage. I'm not sure if you've seen that one. Gage is sticking to just Michigan, and they're kind of trying to grow really quite largely in the state itself. They're not trying to cross borders and get into new states and things like that. They want to dominate Michigan. I look at that as a huge asset because if there's an MSO out there who's looking to move into Michigan, this is an easy play for them. It costs money to enter into a new state. If you're already dealing in that state, it's not a big deal for you to walk up to your regulators and say, listen, we already have 25, 30, 35 dispensaries. We want five more. You already have a relationship with that regulator. So they're probably, you know, get, the paperwork's a little easier. I look at Gage as a huge acquisition target. Not sure who that might be, although I did see a comment on one of my uh, on that video. Someone mentioned Terrasend, and that would be an interesting thing. One of the individuals involved in Terrasend put a nice little chunk of money as an investment into Gage. That's a major introduction. That would be very interesting. With Schwaz being in Colorado, any MSO could look at this company and say, you know what, that's an up-and-comer. They're undervalued. And we want to get into Colorado. They could easily acquire this company inside Colorado, and they would never really be able to operate outside of Colorado, but they would have that structure. So I see this as a potential. We'll see. I'm not making any predictions on that, but I don't believe a lot of these companies we're looking at, these boutique cannabis companies, are going to be standalone in a couple years. Let's look at some numbers that Schwaz has put together. SHWZ on the NASDAQ. Uh, for those who don't quite understand this one, if you have the letter F at the end, and it's usually five, um, five letters, that means that they are not traded on the OTC. The letter F denotes OTC. So SHWC, that's, um, that's a NASDAQ symbol. Um, they did 19.3 million Q1 2021. All right. We're going to talk about 2021, the 19.3 million briefly. What we really want to focus on is the 26.8 million pro forma. Okay, what does pro forma mean? First off, 19.3, that was GAAP, G-A-A-P. 
generally accepted accounting practices. I get a lot of individuals who, um, uh, retail investors, nothing wrong with being a retail investor, but they don't spend their whole day looking at financial data. So they may not understand that principle. So I'm going to explain that real quick. Uh, Gap, you're generally expected to adhere to certain uh, standards when you report your numbers and every single company is is expected to do so by doing that we can look at one company to the next company and understand what these numbers mean that not one particular company is coming up with some kind of crazy number that's like well what exactly is that so generally accepted accounting practices that's what schwa's uh, schwa's printed in q1 was 19.3 gap but Pro forma, they printed 26.8. So what's pro forma? They did a deal where they uh, acquired another company. All right. Had they closed the deal at the beginning of the quarter, they would have realized 26.8 million in revenue. But they uh, finished this deal at the end of the quarter. So that particular company had to uh, report its numbers in its own way. Given that, 26.8 gives us a really strong idea as to what Schwaz could do over the course of the next year. Now, guidance. We've actually been given two guidance. You have to kind of dig. First off, if you just looked at the numbers that they printed, you're looking at the 19.3. Well, that's gap. That's not exactly reality though, because now they own this other company Starbucks. It's uh they operate in obviously in Colorado. Um, in their transcripts for their uh, conference call, they said they upped their guidance from about 100. The high end was about 105 to 110 million. But if you look at the MDNA on their investor presentation, they print 125. What's interesting is when I looked at the 105 and the 110 million, I sat there and I said, well, what could, what would be possible? Uh, aside from the pro forma, what could they probably do? First off, Colorado printed a 25% year over year growth rate. That's all retail inside Colorado. So the question would be with 17 dispensaries, one of the premier companies in Colorado, they're probably going to see some decent sized growth if Colorado continues on that growth rate. This is actually something I'm kind of concerned about. You know, the pandemic, bars weren't open. So what did people do? They went down to the dispensary, bought something and took it home. Now bars are opening up. What's it gonna do to, the, to cannabis? I'm really curious about that. If you look at the numbers, uh, and I have some numbers I put up on, on my website. So please, by all means, uh, hit the link that's down below. Uh, there's a direct link to the article attached to this. But if you look at the numbers for, say, Colorado and Canada and some other states, there was a big bump in, say, March, April, May of last year. Kind of kept going from there. Well, now the pandemic is really kind of screeching to an end with over 50% of the U.S. population now vaccinated. Those people want to go out. So are they going to go out to a dispensary? This is something I'm really curious about as to what happens with the growth rate here in the United States with cannabis. We might be in for a shock. Nonetheless, um, I looked at the 125 and I asked a basic question, can they get there? And what I came up with, which was interesting, was the 105 to 110. I said, no, that's probably shy. They'll probably hit between 110 and 125. I then found the MDNA and saw that they printed 125 and thought, well, okay, I sort of called what they're seeing. They may be just being conservative or maybe it's a typo. Very briefly, this is, this is the gap that they reported 19.3. As you can see, um, they've seen, realized some of the gains from their uh, acquisition, but it's not all. So let's move straight forward to pro forma revenue. The 26.8 is considerably larger than um, the 19. That's about 30% higher. Um, 
given that, this is a huge jump for them. You know, they were printing 8 million prior to that. Now, all of a sudden, they're printing 25, 26, 27 million. So when we break down this revenue, if over the next three quarters, they get zero growth in a state that has already grown 25%, but we don't know what this is, year's going to be simply because everybody's going to be out and about. So maybe, maybe they do have zero growth. Maybe there's a decline in cannabis sales over the course of the next year. This is something that I've mentioned before. This is something I'm kind of have on the back of my mind. I'm wondering, but if they get zero growth, they're looking at about the 105 million that they called. Should they hit 27 and a half, 27 and a half, maybe 28 over the course of the next three quarters on a, a inclusive of the pro forma for Q1? I'm more inclined to believe that the general trend of cannabis sales will increase somewhat. The rate may decline, but I do believe that individuals who have been consuming cannabis on a regular basis over the past year will probably consume some and probably close to the amount they are consuming. Maybe there's new entrants. We will see. And this is something that's going to unfold over the course of the next several months. Um, I've not seen any indication as of yet that there are increases or decreases as of yet. Again, the 25% increase year over year, if you actually looked at the chart, it's kind of like mm, it was a little uh, out of step that Colorado's growth rate had started to decline. It was still increasing though. So maybe we're at a flat line plateau level and then we just modestly increase from there. Gross margins were a little bit of a soft spot, but this isn't exactly the truest figure. And I'm not talking on a pro forma basis. I'm talking on a um, pre-adjustment basis. They And I clarified that on the analysis on the website. Um, they had to make uh, inventory adjustments, value of inventory adjustments. Prior to that, they were hitting about 54%, I think is the number that they quoted in their... Um, uh, the transcripts from their most recent financial statement. Okay, so at 50, call it 50, between 50 and 55, that's a good number. That's a solid number. Dispensaries tend to have more solid numbers than a grow facility. The reason why is simply this. You're paying the same exact rent. You know exactly from five, uh, from one Friday to the next Friday, what your foot traffic is going to be like. So you can control your costs in that way. You're buying a, a, a finished product. So there's no variability in those kinds of costs. Whereas if you're looking at your grow operations, you can see a lot of variability. Now I have seen flip-flops. I've seen companies that come out with their grow facility uh, operations. Gross margins are very impressive and the retail numbers aren't. Um, it happens. So typically we do see uh, retail operations doing quite well. I would expect that they are probably going to see some increases uh, at 17 um, dispensaries. They are looking to expand more going into the next year. I'm not certain on, I've looked around, I didn't see any plans that are gonna be open anytime soon. They did. They basically just said we're at 17 now. If they increase that, that's even better. That's more potential revenue, but they've given us the guidance that we're working with at the same time. So we have a kind of a concept of where they're gonna be. I typically don't put up operating expense, the whole number itself. And the reason is simply this, I usually put up the operating efficiencies. Now, operating efficiencies is a mathematical equation, total operating costs divided by total revenue. As revenues increase, that revenue increase is usually far outpacing total revenue, uh, total operating costs. In this case, you can see that their operating expenses are increasing along with um, their general revenue increases. But mind you, take a look backwards. 
on a pro forma basis, they printed 26.8 million. On a gap basis, they printed 20 million, 19 and a half million. Operating expenses barely budged. So I felt that this, I wanted to show this particular uh, chart at this time simply because you can look at that and say, wow, okay. So we're going to see a lot of revenue and they've contained their costs. I wanted to show this because of that one thing. Let's now look at um, the next chart. You can see how the 19.8 million, given their operating costs, total operating expenses, collapsed this chart. And that's what you want. You want the lowest possible number. At 45%, they're real close to what is kind of a sweet spot for uh, some of the better companies. Now, mind you, pro forma, they printed 26.8, but we don't have the exact operating cost. So I can't come up with that kind of variable and sit there and say, you know, they were probably at 39% or wherever that might have been. Uh, we don't know what those operating costs were. They just gave us some a few headline numbers. At the same time, going back to gross margins, as they increase revenues, you're going to get economies of scale. The same individuals producing just a little more, but they cost exactly the same on an hourly basis. Um, your purchasing power, so let's say you're going to the printer to get some packaging and things like this. Purchasing power increases because you have, you're buying bigger bulk. That improves your gross margin outlook. At the same time, when we start seeing these guys print these higher numbers for their total operating costs, operating efficiencies are probably going to slide downwards significantly. I bet they're probably going to hit about 35, 30 to 35% and be in that sort of sweet spot of some of the better performing companies. Gross margins are, are where I would be looking towards to say, listen, this is where there is some improvement. Nonetheless, if you look at my projections, given their projections, it's not necessarily a situation where you're sort of like, wow, will they ever get there? They already are there. So if they do move from their gross margin situation upwards, it's just more icing on this cake. This is seriously a company where you're going to, there's a, there's a number I'm going to show you where you're going to sit there and say, whoa, because that's what I did. Okay, EBITDA. EBITDA barely eked out a gain here. But mind you, they saw that big jump of the 19 million. So it's trickling through. Here's the thing. They gave us 105 to 110 million. They also gave us about a 30% EBITDA rate. So over the course, it, let, let's make this math real simple. Let's say they hit 100 million. That means they're gonna get 30 million in EBITDA profitability they just printed 300,000. So given the guidance they've given us with that 30%, you're looking at the potential of another 27 million over the course of the next three quarters. That's huge. My And mind you, I'm giving you, um, we're looking at 100 million. These guys are gonna be anywhere between 105, 110, or maybe as high as 125. So that 30% becomes 36 million. So these are these are some numbers where we're looking at the potential of these guys being quite profitable. You need to break this down for a second. How do you get to 30%? And I'm gonna do this here at the end of this presentation where I show where 30% would be with their shares outstanding. So bear with me on that because I've got a kind of a bullet points that I'll show you. But nonetheless, when you break this down, 30% EBITDA, it's not the highest number I've seen, um, but it's real close. And these guys are going to be increasing in revenues. So therefore, they're going to see more economies of scale and marginal profits from that. Marginal profits are those profits for doing just one extra widget or product, if you will, and how much more profit you get in that one time period, maybe per hour or something like that. So we are going to see some marginal profits moving forward.
net income. Now they did have bottom line uh, for operating profits. They were about six and a half million, six point three million, something like that. When you trickle that down through, they have continuing costs, and the total would end up being about nine million dollars. The six million that they earned in profits, then another three extra million on top of that to bring them down to negative 3.6. There were some outlying costs that are non-normal to the course of business. And of course they have within continuing costs, you see uh, costs related to financing and things like this. Um, if you're looking at the chart, uh, the numbers I have up on my website, you'll be able to see, I put all the numbers up there for you so that you can see those numbers and how that breaks down. But if we get all the way up to the 30, 30 to 36 million that they're calling for over the course of the next year, which they've just printed the Q1, all of a sudden this negative wipes out on a quarterly basis. So these guys are real close to net income positive. Now let's look at some more numbers here. Let's look at some possibilities. Let's say, and I'm, I'm, I'm using 100 million just for a nice round number. They're probably going to hit between 105 and 110 million, so maybe a little 5 or 10% more. They may hit 125 million. That's where I really think they're going to be. So 25% more, but nonetheless, I wanted to break this down at 100 million so people can understand this because I want to break this down in a certain kind of way. 40% cost of goods, all right? 35% in operating costs. Now, they've given us 30% in EBITDA. Okay, so that's 70% in costs. Probably 40% in cost of goods, which gets them about a 60% gross margin. They printed about 53 pre adjustment so it's not too far off it's very possible at the same time they're going to see revenue increases so 35 percent is within shot um, the problem with EBITDA or not really a problem but EBITDA is calculated like this you take your cost uh, your revenue then you have your cost of goods then you have total operating costs total operating costs account for two things two basic things, SG&A, sales, general, and administrative, and then uh, deductions and amortizations. EBITDA takes those out. It looks at the core business. It looks at revenue, cost of goods, total operating costs, less depreci uh, depreciation and amortization. So you have to put that back in there. That's why I'm coming up with 35%. But you're looking at, if they're giving us a 30% EBITDA rate, that means you have 70% in costs. Okay. So we kind of have to reverse engineer this a little bit. If, if EBITDA is at 30%, we still have to add in the depreciation and amortization and then continuing costs. All right. I know that's a little much. Uh, I put it's all written up on, on the analysis on this particular thing. If you kind of walk it through, EBITDA, you take some things out, total operating costs, you put those in. So that's how I'm doing that. Next thing, continuing costs are usually about 11%, 10 to 11%. These are your costs for financing. And then when you're um, any kind of outside costs that are not part of the normal business, get tucked into this one, the continuing costs. So EBITDA really kind of looks at the core business. Um, it's total operating costs or total operating profits without the depreciation and amortization. So this gets us to roughly um, 15 to $17 million in profits. Now here's the thing. They got 42 million shares outstanding. They're going to print about 125 million in revenue with 42 million shares outstanding. That's three dollars in revenue per share. Like when I looked at that, I was like, wait, though they just did a deal, so those new numbers aren't in there. Let me go ahead and go back. The MDNA has them at 42 million after the deal. I kept digging further. 
$3 for every share, $3 in revenue for every share. When you break that down, if you're looking at about 17, 15, even 10, you're looking at a really high potential earnings per share based on very few shares outstanding. This was the real eye popper for me. This is the one where I sit there and say, wait, I went back. Then I went back again. I kept running these numbers. These guys, these are like, I, I've been doing some top 10 videos here and there. All of a sudden, I want to do a top 10 video looking at revenue per share, just revenue, just to see where these guys stack up, because I don't think anybody comes close to these guys. I think these guys are outstanding in that particular number right there. I could be wrong. And that could reveal something. I'm like, whoa, okay. Let's look at that one company a little better. Nonetheless, you're looking at about 35, 36 cents per share. Now, normally I look at earnings per share and I project about 100 times future earnings. The S&P 500 with an average of 3.5% revenue increase year over year has a 35 times future earnings. These guys are going way beyond 3.5% year over year increase. If they're in Colorado and they're the premier uh, dispensary system in Colorado and Colorado has a 25% increase year over year, which they just did, 3.5% isn't even, that's not even in the ballpark. So you have to up this. But at the same time, we also have to bring in two variables. What's going to happen this year now that people are going to be out and about? Are they going to be consuming cannabis at the same pace? We don't know that one yet. So this calls into question that 100 times future earnings. The next thing is inflation, inflation, inflation. If interest rates go up, I've got to adjust down my future earnings multiple. That's why this is important. And there is inflation everywhere. So again, we're looking at the opportunity that maybe 100 times is too much at this point. Well, what's enough? We're going to have to kind of play this quarter by quarter, month after month, and I'm going to continue to look at these uh, the economic data going forward. But let's cut it in half. That puts this at $17.5 per share. 50 times future earnings. That's $17.5. The stock's trading at 2 dollars bucks. Can you hear my eyelashes? cutting through the air these guys they have so few shares with so much revenue and so much potential this is what i look at i'm like wait let me go back and do these numbers again i'm clearly missing something no as you can see the stock chart no one else is really looking at this stock either but they just are in the process of transitioning. And this is what makes this stock in this moment interesting. My expectation, and I'm getting a lot of questions, when do these stocks move? When do these stocks move? Listen, as value investors, you don't care about the stock movement. Warren Buffett never sat there and said, did you see the price of that stock move? He never once did. Your only concern is how much value am I buying today? at this price all right at this particular price you're looking at about 35 cents per share that is about 15 percent given the current price okay other individuals are going to sit there after you get in and say wait what did they just print and that's it they rush in and that's when price moves up as value investors our only concern is what value we get today based on the price and the value you get today is over the course of the next several quarters that's how we break this down as far as i'm concerned this stock is significantly undervalued it might be the most significantly undervalued stock relative to everybody else I want to say a big thanks for stopping by the website today if it's your first time stopping by please by all means there's a uh, email subscription down below i send out my email on a daily basis you'll get the video and a link to my uh, analysis on my website 
that's free can't beat a free price um as well feel free to subscribe and like the uh but hit the button down below on the youtube channel numbers are growing really rapidly i can't say thank you enough to all you people out there who support me uh i've seen some amazing comments so thank you so much for those guys who are doing the shout outs i try to try to uh jump in there and say thanks in those and answer some questions if you got a direct question please by all means go straight to the website there's a contact form ask me straight directly it's one of the best ways to get in touch with me thanks again see you in the next video